Welcome to GoPowerCat.com's Power Chat, sponsored by Blue Mark Energy from the WTC Gig Powered Studios. Well, he is the biggest star in K-State's galaxy, certainly outside of athletics. Eric Stone Street is a two-time Emmy Award winner as part of the incredible ensemble cast of Modern Family. And he stopped by to have a little discussion about his life and career. Here's our Power Chat with Eric Stone Street. Joined by Eric Stone Street. Hi, buddy. How are hello, you? hello, hello. Yeah, you're. This is appearing later on the website, but you're in here for Coach Snyder's retirement celebration. Yep, tonight, Bramlage. That's pretty cool. Yeah, it's I'm really glad cool. they finally found a time, a space. And, yeah, oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's uh, it's it's good. I'm it's, excited to go and uh, celebrate him. I have no idea what where I'm going to. I just know that. Uh, I know. I'm like, I'm you, going. How do you arrange it? How do you set this up? Yeah. I mean, do you have fireworks indoors? Do you sure. I think there'll be pyro. Yeah. I think it's, it's nothing says Bill Snyder like indoor pyro. <laughs> it's because he's a flashy guy. Yeah. <laughs> it's a flashy guy. I want to go back to the start. Uh, let's, in the first half here, I want to talk about your career. Yeah, sure. Um, you moved to Chicago. What year did you graduate, Casey? I left 95. So you head to Chicago. Yep. Right away? Uh, yeah, right away. Literally left Manhattan, Kansas, spent a week in Kansas City and drove up to Chicago with my parents and they uh, they unloaded me into a, an apartment on the north side of Chicago. Man, that's just jumping into the deep end. Yeah, it? well, it was it was specifically so it wasn't the deep end. I thought, well, I'll try Chicago out ah. and then I'll save the deep end LA for for later. I was dipping my toe in because I'd done plays here in this building right behind me in Nichols Hall. Uh, and people had said, you know, I was good or whatever, but I didn't know if they knew what good was necessarily. So I thought Chicago would be a good place to figure that out. You do improv training. How mm -hmm. long were you in Chicago? Two years. I had moved there to think like, well, I'm just going to stay there. I, I, I mean, th when I moved there in 95, late 95, uh, moving into 96, I thought, well, you can make a you know career for yourself in Chicago. You sure can. And um, it's kind of changed a little bit now. Um, but I thought I was moving to Chicago to be an actor and that would be that. And then it was about probably a, a little over a year after I was there that I realized probably if I want to do this on a bigger scale, I'm going to need to move to L.A. I have these visions of you loading up your VW Bug and all your belongings. And Ford Contour. <laughs> Not as sexy as the <laughs> VW Bug. Hey, I, I beg your pardon. <laughs> Red Ford Contour, gray leather interior. Man, Sex. that's sweet. Yeah. yeah, that's sweet. And driving to L.A., how long before, I, I mean, the life of an actor, actress is just, you're fishing. Yeah, well, yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, you never know what's going to happen. But you have to be there to figure that out. I mean, you can't, it's what I tell people that ask me, you know, for advice all the time of like, how, how, how do I do it? I'm like, well, you have to, you have to go to where that it happens. That doesn't mean it can't happen at community th in community theater in Manhattan, Kansas, but you have to participate in whatever is available right. to you. And exactly. if you want something bigger, you have to go to where the bigger things happen. So uh, in researching this, I used uh, Wikipedia, which is you know oh, a gosh. known reliable yes. uh, source of information, but it said 1999 Dharma and Greg. Yeah, that was my first uh, television credit. I watched that episode. Eric, where were you? Were you one of the hippies in that episode? No, uh, I was. Did you watch the episode? I, yeah, for the most. Then you didn't. Then you didn't. You didn't watch it because you can't not recognize me. I must have. Just My name was it. Chester, and I had like three lines where she's running for office, 
and she comes to my door and I ask her to be my alibi. You know what? They must have cut that out because I noticed that the episode on YouTube was 20 minutes long. And I'm like, what happened? Yeah, it should be 22 minutes. Yeah, so they must have Son cut that out. Guns. Well, oh. you can go to my, my reel. I'll send you my reel. Oh, that's good. <laughs> but no, I got that part. Oh, I got that part, um, that contact, because when I moved to L.A. from Chicago, I really only had like one name in my back pocket and it was this lady named Jillian O'Neill who was the casting associate for a lady named Nikki Valco who cast Dharma and Greg and she said yeah we'll, we'll call you in you know and give you a chance and they called me in a few times and I never got uh, the part and then eventually got that small part on Dharma and Greg but the cool thing about that full circle moment is the building that I auditioned for that uh, role in is about 250 feet from where my trailer is for Modern Family so wow. it took me about 12 years but uh, full circle moment there. Dharma and Greg was an underappreciated show. Chuck Lorre. Chuck Lorre. Dottie Dartland created it. Chuck Lorre who created uh, uh, Big Bang Theory and uh, uh, Charlie Sheen won. He's, a, he's an epic television creator. Yeah, you know, I went back, like I said, to watch that. And I'm like chuckling. At it. It's like, this, this held up. Yeah. This still held up. Uh, you were in Almost Famous. Yes. First which movie. fitting. Yeah. Fitting almost name. then. Yep. Cameron Crowe, incredible director. Made me feel like a movie star. That was that was surreal. Like that's that's where I'm like, oh my gosh, this is really, this is really happening. Which, interestingly enough, was one of the t potential titles for Almost Famous. Uh, when because when I did it, it was called the Untitled Cameron Crow Project, and he was trying to decide what he was going to name it. And one of the names was "It's All Happening," because that was apparently a phrase of the time. And if you watch Almost Famous, you'll hear a character say "It's All Happening" a lot, and that was one of the potential names. That's interesting. It, then I, I got to see uh, an episode of Malcolm in the Middle. Mm -hmm. Now, the Exterminator. You, you you pulled off Exterminator very well, by Thank the way. You. you seem very authoritative. You didn't know mm -hmm. what you're talking about. When you're on set with Brian Cranston and he's in Malcolm in the Middle, are you thinking this is one of the greatest American actors of my generation? Well, I only really knew Brian Cranston then as Tim Watley, uh, Jerry Seinfeld's dentist. From Seinfeld. <laughs> Forgot about that. I think his name was Tim Watley, yeah. But I didn't really know Brian Cranston as Brian Cranston then. But what's really neat about that, again, in my world, there's always these kind of big, giant, swooping circles. Brian Cranston, I worked with him. He, he and Jane Kaczmarek were so nice to me. Took me to lunch that day. They didn't really know, even know what they were shooting because they were shooting this pilot and putting it in the can, and then they were going to release it months later. So they didn't really have an idea of how big of a hit that was going to be or what really they were shooting because the creator, Linwood Bomber, was sort of like um, kind of cryptic with everything. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget sitting there at, at lunch with Brian and Jane. Again, so nice to me. No reason they needed to take me to lunch and talk to me, Phil the Exterminator, but uh, they had no idea what they were shooting. And then, again, 10, 11, 12 years later, I'm friends with Brian Cranston. He's directing Modern Family. He's multi Emmy winner, Tony winner, blah blah blah. And uh, it's neat to be able to say to him, "You're as nice now as you were when you took some unknown actor to lunch on the set of Malcolm cool. in the Middle." I, I'd never really watched Malcolm in the Middle, but it was one of the first shows where the the character broke the wall and started talking to the to yeah. the audience, which you do on Modern Family, mm. which I've never enjoyed until Modern Family. You didn't like The Office. I didn't. I no. I didn't actually. Interesting. Uh, I, I've watched some of it and I chuckle, but I didn't like the breaking of that wall until I watched Modern Family. I'm like this is well, this is really well done and organically put in here. Yeah. Well, thank you. They. I mean, we weren't first the first to no. do it, but I think we did do it in a good job. And we've done less of that as the show has progressed and migrated to different kind of show. Another show I never really watched was CSI. Mm -hmm. Twelve episodes over five years. Yeah. At that point, do you feel like you made it. No, but I feel really good because, and I got that because um, Almost Famous kind of gave me some credibility. That was the first audition I ever walked into where the casting director said, uh, hey guys, this is Eric Stone Street, who was in Almost Famous as the hotel desk clerk. And that's really an important thing for people to hear. It's like our business, Hollywood, is everybody's scared of something and everybody has somebody to impress. Right. And so when you can walk into a room and with the pedigree that Cameron Crowe hired you for a DreamWorks, Steven Spielberg produced movie, that gives them credibility. It doesn't mean I'm any better talented or more talented or more equipped for the job. It just means somebody else thought I was. So then when I walk into the room and they can say that, that helps a lot. And that's why like five lines in a feature film to this day are huge. Hardest job to get in our business, yeah. 
but it's a really big thing for someone to get because it moves the needle for you a little bit. And uh, CSI, I had auditioned for the coroner's assistant, uh, but they thought, I know this is gonna sound like I'm complimenting myself, they thought I was too funny uh, for that <laughs> part. So uh, they, uh, I got to the ca my, t my car and they called me back in, it was raining, and um, I went back in and they said, we'd like you to read the, for this part, and I did that part. Recurring role. Great. That's a cool story because that's the first time I ever watched a TV show brand new on CBS. And by the end of the season, the first season, I was on the TV show. I'd never experienced that. That's crazy. Yeah. It's like, oh, this new show CSI is coming on. I'm like, oh, I really like this show. And then little did I know I would be on it by the end of the show or end of the season. It strikes me, though, after you moved to L.A., it started moving. A lot of people go to L.A. and wait, yeah. wait, and go to audition and audition. But it just started clicking for you, the slow build upwards. Yeah, I kept, I kept kind of stumbling forward. That's that's correct. But I had done commercials in Chicago and had enough of a tape <coughs> of myself uh, to show people that that got me in the door for commercial agents. And then again, Jillian O'Neill just getting me those auditions for Darman and Greg gave me experience to audition. But, you know, again, there's a there's big, huge gaps of times right. that I'm not doing any anything, you know. So I, I wasn't living in my car, but I certainly wasn't like. What are you doing to pay the bills? Commercials. I was lucky with commercials, doing um, different commercials for different companies. I did a campaign for IBM, um, very popular campaign back in the day. Uh, I think I did like 17 commercials, wow. and that's when commercials were like. And I was in the generation of when commercial actors would be like, oh, commercials aren't what they used to be. And I was like, well, these are pretty, this is pretty good. But it used to be you'd get a Pepsi commercial and it was like $65,000 mm -hmm. for a year. And then I just missed that era because of the expansion of cable and just buyers and advertisers being able to pay you less because there's just more right. places for them to advertise. But um, yeah, that's what sustained me. Bought my first house really by doing commercials. I did not watch Ninja Cheerleaders. Oh God! Um, See, these are done. Those these things. That's a favor. So that's somebody that calls me. It's like, oh, my friend's an actor, um, because of different people that you meet, and they're like, hey, will you do this? And I, I was of the mindset, you know, I had, I needed to get on set. I needed to experience, like, you know, what things were. So that's why you do stuff like that. Your character's name was Beer Gut? Beer Gut, yeah. That's, and I don't even drink beer. That's, that's not right, man. No, not cool. Well, that's called acting. Yeah, totally. I'm sure you pulled it off. Like I said, I did not watch it. Oh, don't. Because I wasn't convinced that the actresses were actually ninjas. No, I don't think they were. Or cheerleaders. Aren't, isn't it called Ninja Cheerleaders? Yeah. Oh, God. Yeah, was, I did another uh, favor for a friend one time, and it's just called Fat. <laughs> <laughs> and I played a park ranger, I think. But everybody in the movie was heavy set. I don't know whatever happened to that. God, terrible. That seems like a high concept gone wrong. <laughs> <laughs> That's oh, just. It not. sounds like somebody that was heavy set. It's like, God, oh, I'm going to make a movie with just fat people. It's like nobody will see that. See, one of my dreams is uh, the spin off The Bachelor, The Fatchelor. The Fatchelor? So all, all the ladies show up and the guy's heavy set. He's a great guy, but they're thinking they're going to get a male model and instead yeah. they get. I auditioned for a show years ago called. Um, just lost the name of it, but it was a fake show where a bride played a joke on her entire family. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I Joe, that. not the Joe Schmo show, but yeah, schlub something. And I auditioned to be the groom of that, to be this fake guy this girl was marrying to pull off that. on her. That guy did a good job. Of that oh, role. he did great, and he's he was just on Modern Family last year. He's a great character actor and has been working for a long time. He was on um, Grey's Anatomy as the bartender. Uh, good guy. Um, yeah. Does that fall under the heading of some people do? anything for a buck even if it's screwing with your entire family well people you can't overestimate and over value uh, over uh, value how much people like want to be on TV right that's that's why when you now watch sporting events and the cameras on them people act crazy or when you're at a, a live sporting event like at LA Kings game the camera goes on people and all of a sudden their shirts come off it's like it's like Roman times it's like yeah. we're, it's weird <laughs> It's like this isn't even on any. This is just right there, and it's like I'm oh, but I'm on a screen. I'm gonna take off my shirt. Like all right, go for it. But you know, going going back to like doing anything for a buck, uh, there's there's some value in that question because in the beginning I would do anything that I needed to do to get a job. Meaning when I was in Chicago and my career started in L.A., if 
I was going to be in a commercial and they wanted to paint me blue or purple or whatever, I, I did whatever the job required. But at some point I did start to say like, I'm not doing X or this or whatever anymore. It's because I just didn't, somebody else can cash that check, you know? Right. Like, I don't want to do that anymore. I did it and now I'm done with that. But I was painted silver for Coors Light, purple for uh, Northwestern was my first gig in Chicago. Yeah, that's the first, do you know that yep. story? Yep. They'll go ahead. First story, I, first job I ever auditioned for. They walk in, I walk in, and it's for Northwestern University. They just uh, were in the Rose Bowl. Dar Darnell Autry and their head coach was the linebacker then. Who's their head coach now? Uh, Barnett or no? Gary Barnett was Gary the head Barnett. coach then. Yeah. But anyway, um, the director's in there. He's a Northwestern alum, and he's doing these commercials as a gift back to the college. He's like, "Hey, man, do you mind popping off your shirt?" And I'm like, "I'm sorry, what?" And they're like, "Oh, do you mind taking off your shirt?" I'm like, "What? The casting couch is real? Like this is real? Like, this is my first audition ever, ever!" And so they tell me the concept, and they go, "Are you familiar with football?" And I'm like, "Yeah." And they go, "Okay, well, this is for Northwestern University. We're the Wildcats." I'm like, "Yeah, I, I'm familiar with purple Wildcats and football. I'm, we're good here." Got the job. Did these commercials out on the streets of Chicago, basically espousing the beauty of Northwestern football and season ticket sales. And then that turned into a national campaign for all of college football where I was Joe Football and talking about, you know, just college football. I think I did 12 commercials for college football. So at some point are you worried that all I'm gonna ever do in acting is have my body painted? Yeah, well then I was red and blue, which was very hard for me to no, be painted red and blue. That was good. like, that. you wanna talk about accepting something for a paycheck. I'm like, okay, <laughs> I'll do this. <laughs> It's like sometimes you got to be the villain, man. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes, sometimes. you got to be the ale. Um, but yeah, yeah. But I always knew that I would not always be that guy. I had bigger aspirations. But this, this is what I needed to do to get started. It's amazing. 2009. When do you? It's probably pre 2009. When do you go to your uh, the casting, the audition for Modern Family? Uh, like February, early February, I think, was my first audition. A friend of mine come over and, a and asked me to help him with the material. He had an audition for my part, w what would be my part on Modern Family. And we all kind of helped each other out. Sure. He's Colorado Ram, Colorado State Ram. Um, so we would help, you know, help each other out. And he came over, we walked through it, and he's like, dude, you should audition for this. I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm gonna try. I'm gonna try to get an audition. And I went in and did the audition and they, they thought I was funny, but they didn't weren't interested. Said it wasn't going to go any further. That's the term in Hollywood when it's you're done. Um, and then about a week later, the casting director called back and they said, "Chris and Steve, the creators of the show, they're still thinking about Eric. Would he come back in more appropriately dressed, clean shaven? Because I didn't really dress up for auditions and dress the part. I always thought that made me look desperate. You know, right? Like, no, I'm not coming in as a chef. I got to be a car dealer in like 20 minutes. So I'm not jumping through that hoop." It's already enough hoops. <laughs> so I, I went to Macy's and got an outfit, helped the, the lady at Ralph Lauren uh, help me pick out some navy pants, a gingham, lavender gingham shirt, and a gray zip-up cardigan. I still have the stuff hanging in my closet. I said, if I get this part, I'll come back and, and thank you. So I went in and auditioned again, and they again said it's not going any further. Wow. Now I'm mad because I'd spent money. Uh, On well, stuff you probably weren't going to wear. But. Yeah, probably. Well, maybe the pants. And then... Um, then uh, about three days later, they called back and said, okay, they want to test Eric uh, with Jesse, who got who had already been cast as Mitchell. So then I went to the studio test for 20th Century Fox, and then the next day went to the network test. And then about 15 minutes after the network test is when I got the job. So was someone behind the scenes championing you? They keep sending you away? Well, interestingly back. enough, between the first time I went in, which was a, we're talking about about a two and a half week period, between the first time I went in and when I got the job, the director of the pilot was hired. And he was a guy that had seen me improvise for years in Chicago, when I lived in Chicago and had yeah. seen me improvise in LA. And he was himself getting some traction in the business as a director. And so he came onto the project and Chris and Steve already were fans of my audition. They just didn't necessarily know what Cam and Mitch really looked like together. And it's another lesson for actors just to know. It's like, well, they, not, they don't really always know what they want. You have to go in and demonstrate, give it to, give it to them. And so Jason Weiner, the director of the pilot, got hired and then he did become a little bit of an inside source saying, your instincts are right on this guy, he is very funny, I've seen him improvise and I know it's not just him coming in and killing an audition, right. that he can, he can sustain funny. At, well, first of all, you get to the set and you look around you're like, wow, this is... Well, Ed O'Neill. Yeah. Freaking legend. Yeah, he's just hysterical. And great. I mean... 
anybody watching this, given where we are and who would watch this, I can tell you, you would love Ed O'Neill. Like he is just like, he's our people. He has a pot roast in the crock pot, a bottle of wine open all the time. He collects knives. He's got a mace, an amazing knife collection. Well, like, like stabby knives or kitchen knives? Killing knives. <laughs> That's beautiful. Yeah, yeah, killing knives. But like really expensive knives. Like he's like, Eric, I got to show you this knife. I'm like, how much was this knife, Ed? He's like, it's pretty expensive. You know. I got him a hatchet as a gift, like this really cool custom hatchet. This the guy I know that's a mm -hmm. Navy SEAL. He has a company called Half Face Blades. You should check it out. Uh, gives money to Navy SEAL projects. But he makes these amazing tomahawks. And I got Ed, and he called me. He goes, Eric, I'm just walking around the house with this tomahawk. <laughs> He's like, I can't take it out of, I can't take it out of my hand. The purchase of this, the per I didn't know this. He taught me this. But when you hold a knife or anything, I guess, the way it feels in your hand is called the purchase. Never knew that. Never cool, heard cool of that. fact, right? Yeah. So he goes, the purchase on this tomahawk is unbelievable. I'm just walking around with this tomahawk. I love it. I so can I just, hear him. <laughs> right? Yeah. He's great. Ed, Ed is phenomenal. He's such a good dude. So I mean, you're filming this show. You're taping this show. Yep. And it's done in bits and pieces. And any show is, There's, you know, we get to see the beginning and middle and the end. When do you know this show's legit? Oh. Yeah, well, given my experience of the 12 years previous and getting my fair re share of reads at Pilots, I knew when I read it, it was special. But there's so many variables that can still kill it. Um, but then with Steve and Chris and their pedigree being, you know, Cheers, or I mean, Frasier and um, uh, Just Shoot Me and a few other shows that they had both worked on that were good, Wings, um, I knew that we had a good chance. And then when Jason was hired in the cast, it all seemed like things were in position for it to line up. But again, still, I mean, 99% of shows that are shot in Hollywood, you never, never see the right. light of day. So I always thought there was a chance, but felt like, and then honestly, when I knew it was a hit or was going to be a hit, has to do with Kansas, I brought the pilot back. I knew the show was picked up. I got a copy of the pilot. I brought it back to my parents' house in Kansas City, told them to invite whoever they wanted that I think they ended up inviting about 60 people and we did two separate screenings in my f folks basement um, and brought all their friends and all their friends kids and grandkids or whatever over and I just watched them watch the show and I watched where they laughed and I, I sent an email it's a great I sent an email self evaluation back, yep I sent an email back to Chris and Steve and I said I can report from the breadbasket that we are funny like and I knew I knew I knew when I saw them all laughing that like oh god this is gonna be big. Getting any scripted show that gets those really deep laughs, that's great writing. Well, the pilot, I mean, talk to I, mean, I happen to be in it, so x me out of it. But the Modern Family pilot is considered maybe the best pilot of television ever. Mm -hmm. Like, truth. Writers revere that pilot because so much has to be delivered in a pilot episode of television. So much has to be delivered. And everybody to a T said when they watched that pilot, it felt like we weren't watching a pilot. It felt like we were watching characters we've known for years. And that is it's hard to accomplish. And, and even if you're good, it's hard to get over the hump and get an audience. You got to get the right slot. You got to just start capture people and build momentum. I, I fell in love with a sitcom last year the kids are all right. Oh yeah, and it got canceled. Got canceled. It was a hysterical. Really yeah, well I love that show. show too. Well, I would imagine a lot of that has to do with the, the expense, expense, and they they did a show around kids, and kids are kind of a hard, tricky thing to do when you're mi when they're minors as far as hours and how right. you can shoot and stuff like that. That's why on shows like ours, people are always like, well, "Where's Aubrey or where's Lily?" Well, you have to write kind of around kids a lot of times in their school and their hours. Right. It's like watch Everybody Loves Raymond and see how they handled the kids on that show. And you never see them. They're always go upstairs and then you bing, bing, come downstairs, out out the door, and that's how you establish that you have kids. But you don't, you can't write a show that's all around kids. I suspect a couple of those kids will be around the business for a while. Yeah, just great instincts. Oh, good actors. But kids on Blackish are amazing too. Yes, those are good acting kids. Good, and our kids are incredible. Uh, they've all grown up. They all, Nolan and Rico, I tell the story. <laughs> they were building forts and playing Nerf guns on set when we started Modern Family. And now one drives a Range Rover and the other drives a Tesla. I'm like, 
Are you kidding me? Awesome. It's like that's a growth right there. That's forts and Nerf guns to very expensive cars. <laughs> that's spectacular. You just finished up season ten, and it was announced you're going to do eleventh and final season. Yeah, eleventh and final. Gonna, will this bring it to a package, or just be eleven? You know, eleven season of episodes that in repeat won't have a finality to them. No, it'll they'll it'll have a finality. Okay. I think the, the I think Chris and Steve and the whole writing staff who mostly have been there from the beginning. Uh, will want to give the audience a sort of somewhat pleasing feeling at the end but I also think given the blueprint of the show that there'll be an element to the ending that will just let the audience and people who love this family imagine how the family might continue on uh, creating new members spinoff I mean, I th I would be surprised if somebody isn't approached to do a spinoff yeah. because the brand is very good for ABC and they haven't been able to launch a, a comedy as successful as Modern Family, not taking anything away from the Goldbergs and Blackish, right. but, you know, we've been their marquee and sure. their flagship for a long time. And um, I think they'll probably ask some somebody to do something. The, I don't... The magic of the show is... Uh, there's no star. It's, yeah. It, they have done an incredible job of parsing up good stuff for everyone so all the characters are evenly developed. I don't know how they did that. Well, part of it is we got lucky again with Ed O'Neill. There's a saying in, in TV that you can't be a bigger a-hole than the number one a-hole <laughs> on the call sheet. Meaning... Right. Nobody can get away with behavior that number one, and we happen to have a guy that's number one that doesn't like pull any of that hissy fits. Yeah. So that means nobody else gets to do that, and I don't even think it's in any of our natures yeah. to do that. I mean, you know, we all have limits, and we all have, feel like we know when we're being taken advantage of, and things like that, which happens, uh, and we have boundaries. But nobody's being like, I'm not coming out of my trailer because you know. And I've been on shows where that's happened. I I mean, there's a I, I watched a, a cast on a show go from seemingly all happy and good to sort of being angry at something. And I'm, I have no idea why. I wasn't part of that business. But I, I've waited on an actor yeah. to come out of a trailer before because they were trying to make a statement. Could have been, they could have been in the right, could have been in the wrong. I have no idea. But we've never done that. No one's ever done that. So part of the success is that we all are e carrying equal parts of the show. Yeah. You, you didn't do that today either. What? Wait in your trailer. We no. don't even have a trailer. No, for you. God no. But I, did you see how on time I was? By the way, I, I take so much pride in that. I told you I'd be here at ten thirty. I realized I wasn't going to be here at ten thirty, and I said I'd be closer to right. ten thirty-five or ten forty-five. Pulled in ten thirty-seven. I mean, un unreal. That's Kansas knowledge. That's even a stop in Topeka, getting a drink. Oh yeah, you get that <sighs> that drive. You can hit it. You know exactly what yeah, you're doing. Yeah, but I'd never done 20, I hadn't done 2440 since I was in college. Oh, so I you came down 24? Yeah, came down 24. Seen the crowd. Yeah, St. Mary's, Silver Lake. The Army Navy store's gone. Oh. We used to go there to get all of our fatigues for paintballs. This uh, children or fraternity? Uh, fraternity. Okay, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's like playing paintball as a yeah. child. Get I just saw the football team went and played paintball. Those are cool things they're doing. Yeah. I mean, they started it under Coach Snyder, yeah. but cool thing one thing before we break uh i love you i'm art of modern family cam is you, you pull it off i mean it's just amazing yeah. what you do secret life of pets yeah i watched the first one and i laughed my ass off of course i'm a dog person yeah so i i literally we this, love animals this was a documentary to me this is what they really do <laughs> yeah right, you know? right, 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 right they plot against you when you're gone and they have have things uh but you play the big lovable fluff ball Duke. Yeah. Do you feel it was typecasting? I do. I do feel like that. You yeah. couldn't be the little Pekingese. You know, when when we went when I when I went in for that first meeting uh, with Chris, his name's Chris Melodondri. He owns Illumination. They do Minions and Despicable mm -hmm. Me and that stuff. Very successful man. Uh, and he starts telling me about this movie, and I'm just like, oh. now you have to understand, this is now eight years ago that first meeting, and I go, man, this is going to be huge. This is going to be a big hit. And then it wasn't dawning on me that he was asking me to be in the movie. And he kept saying, so what do you think? And I kept telling him, I'm like, yeah, it's going to be huge, man. It's going to, I mean, you're the first person to do this. I mean, the animal, animals. And then finally he was like, do you want to be in the movie? I'm like, oh my God. Yeah. Which carrot, which one? Like, I don't, he's like the big brown dog. We want you to be Duke. And I'm like, I'm in, I'm done. 
And you just go to a sound booth and record your lines. Nobody's yeah. around you. Yeah. Nobody's around. They'll give you they kind of set the scene up for you, give you direction of what's happening in the scene just for for tone and for volume, you know. Obviously, you talk different when your head's hanging out of a car than you would in a small contained space. So they tell you those basic things and then I would somebody a little kid just asked me this yesterday how long it took me to do Secret Life of Pets. The movie uh, takes like a year and a half, two years. And then my part probably is in the 20s or 30s of hours that I'm actually in the booth mm -hmm. because there's so much stuff that you never hear, never see. Right. And then there's so much stuff that you go in that they lose and scrap and come up with a new direction and go. And that's what takes the bulk of the time. But yeah, well, Kevin and I and uh, Pat and Oswald, we're not interacting with each other. The editors wow. make it seem like we are. And Secret Life of Pets Two is out right now. It is out, yeah. I, feel I think like it's. I think it's probably not. I think it's probably not in the theaters. Well, I don't know how long movies last in the theaters. I'm sure it's on demand. Okay. DVDs. Well, so. I've been waiting for that. I'm not a big theater guy. I, I, well, oh, you haven't seen two yet? No, I haven't seen two yet. Oh, I want you'll to like watch it. it home. It's very cute. Yeah, I feel like we should throw it to a clip, but we're not there yet. In this you don't have the, clip the episode, potential. and you'd have to pay for it. Well, well, I'm certainly not going to do that. Yeah, God, I no. paid for water for it. God yeah, sakes. I'm not paying for a clip too. This is this is official water of uh, GoPowerCat.com. This is. Yeah. Okay, then it's I won't a, say anything. Okay, that's. We, this is wonderful. It's not like we actually get paid for this. We'll be right back with more with Eric Stone Street on the Power Channel.